Welcome to another stellar episode of That 911 Guy. After the popularity of my previous interview with designer of the 996, Pinky Lai, you lovely enthusiasts told me that you would like to see more interviews with the legends who created the iconic Porsche 911. With that in mind, my latest interviewee is a cracker. Step forward, Mr. Benjamin Dimson. Ben's history is fascinating. Not only was he responsible for the 964's exterior design under Richard Soderberg at Style Porsche, of course, he also played a key part in design of the legendary 959. On top of that, he was also project manager for the first ever 911 Speedster project in the 3.2 Carrera. The story is a fascinating one. So yet again, it's a little bit longer than the nine minutes and 11 second videos that I usually do. The other thing to bear in mind is as well that the video is recorded via Zoom, okay? Ben lives in Northern California. I'm here in a very rainy UK. It's the only way we could do it. So you'll have to bear in mind with the quality in places. As I say, the interview is fascinating. I hope you enjoy it. Ben Dimpson, what an absolute honour this is for me to, to have this conversation. I, I can't really think of another designer that's had such a profound impact on Porsche sports cars uh, as yourself. Thank you, Lee. It's a pleasure to meet you and uh, looking forward to our discussion. Yes, I'm, I'm sure we're all about to learn quite a lot here. So Ben, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to start by talking about your early career because you're something of a globetrotter. Your educational life started in Manila, of course. Then you were right. stateside in, in California, and that was all before you ended up at Porsche at Stuttgart. So if you wouldn't mind kind of filling that in a little bit as to what, what took you to, to Porsche by 1981. Okay, very well. Um, you know, as, as, as you said, you know, I grew up in Manila and I was exposed uh, to, uh, you know, quite a few uh, cars, you know, beginning with American, European and, and Japanese cars. You know, the Philippine, um, you know, car environment was heavily influenced by uh, the European, American and Japanese manufacturers at the time. You know, this was in the, uh, the 60s and the 70s. Um, I went to a university in the Philippines to uh, begin industrial engineering before I learned about uh, design. So while I was in the university in Manila, uh, because back then, you know, car design uh, literally existed only in the United States and, and in Europe. And I happened upon a uh, flyer in the university bulletin board about the General Motors uh, design program. And that tweaked my interest that such a career existed. And um, once I found out about design, that really, really uh, tweaked my interest. You know? We uh, traveled to the U.S. and visited some friends and relatives. So while in the U.S., then I, of course, uh, followed up on the links to the Art Center College of Design. And uh, once I saw the campus and the program and, of course, uh, fell in love with California, the car culture at the time was just incredible. Once I began studying at the art center, that was it. You know, it was a bug. I was hooked. Upon graduation, I got the offer to join uh, Ford, Volkswagen, and, and then finally Porsche came about and offered me the job. And when Porsche's offer came, it was a no-brainer for me. I, I just never expected it, yeah. that uh, my application would actually be taken seriously by anyone at Porsche. You were involved to begin with with the 928 redesign under the, the original designer of that car, Wolfgang Mobius. I'm keen to know kind of beyond that and from a 911 perspective, your involvement with the 959. Well, with the 959, that was, um, that was developed in Richard Soderberg's studio. It was considered the advanced design studio at the time. Wolfgang Mobius was responsible for the production um, designs of cars, but Richard Soderbergh would would uh, handle you know specialty cars like the 959 okay. and the, some of the racing cars or the rally cars at the time. With the 959, I was appointed the the lead designer for the 959 program because I was one of the at that time I, I became one of the more senior designers uh, within the studio and had had uh, quite. Uh, 
good success with earlier uh, programs such as the 928 S4 and the 944 Turbo. And that is a really quick rise, isn't it, from joining in 81. And, and, and I think by now with the 959, are we at sort of 1984-ish? Yeah, 84, 85 when it started, when the program started. You, know, you have to remember too that uh, Porsche had a very small team. I think the entire studio probably had about uh, 30 people and there were maybe three or four designers uh, in each studio. You know? And um, I was lucky with the 928 program that uh, Lapine and the other design gurus, they liked the proposal that I did for the 928, which heralded the uh, future face or, or the, the future look of most Porsches, you know, that very homogenous front end um, with the twin slot uh, air intakes and the yeah. integration of the fog lamps. So that became a signature that Lapine and the, the design gurus at the time decided would be the, the face of Porsches for the 80s. No? Because of that, I, I was lucky to be assigned in, in several projects that continued on that, uh, that look and feel. Yeah. Um, now, mind you, I was working with uh, a lot of other designers who worked uh, with that principle too and applied them throughout the Porsche line. I just happened to be the one who lucked out and was able to introduce this look. The 959, obviously, it was a real trailblazer for many reasons, but like from a design point of view, there were many uh, different materials used for the first time. For example, Kevlar, wasn't it? So like, was that difficult from a design point of view to work with these different materials over what was previously used to at the company? Well, there were uh, some restrictions because uh, unlike uh, just regular fiberglass, the process was slightly different. You know, you're working with different resins. However, when it came to uh, the generation of the actual form of the car, uh, the material actually lent itself very well to it. And the fact that uh, it was stronger, lighter in weight, all added to the, the picture for the 959. The goal for the 959 was... Uh, at such an extreme level. It was to introduce four wheel drive. It was to guarantee that uh, the car could do uh, 200 miles an hour. So th these were very tremendous goals that uh, were incredibly challenging, not just from the design side, uh, but from an engineering side too. Yeah. So um, aerodynamics played a very critical control uh, for the car, especially for the design because for a car to perform at 200 miles an hour, the aerodynamics of the car had to be spot on, you know, to keep the car from uh, literally taking off. The, the car needed to be grounded and therefore aerodynamics uh, almost dictated a lot of the design development of the car. From the front end to the fenders to the air intakes, you know, that air intake um, off the, the shoulder uh, in front of the rear fender, that was dictated by by aerodynamics. The rear spoiler, the fact that it was integrated into the fenders uh, was also dictated by aerodynamics. That height that it had to maintain from the deck, downforce and the low drag coefficient were, were the goals at the time. And a lot of that dictated the shape. You know? The active aerodynamics uh, was already integrated in much of the bodywork. You know, therefore, the sills uh, being the way they were, um, added to a little bit of that ground effect that was required. You know, the shaping of the, the fender lips to extract the air from the fender wells. Yeah. That was all very part of it. You know, that was all very intentional. That was all uh, dictated by the uh, experimentation in the wind tunnel. When you compare what the 959 had to the F40 that Ferrari did. I mean, technologically, the 959 was so far advanced. Yeah, and, and like you say, you know, the, the 959, to have that level of performance, which unlike the F40, then gave you the comfort and luxuries of air conditioning and leather seats and a radio, you know, it was such an accomplished car. And as we well know, it's kind of been the yardstick, really, for technological evolution at Porsche ever since. The 959 was late or delayed. It was uh -huh. expensive as well. Um, it cost the company a lot of money. There are arguments that it cost Helmut Bott his job at the time. I I'm just wondering, like, from within Porsche during the build of the 959, what was the feeling among staff? What, you know, were you excited for it or was it becoming kind of 
a painful project, you know? Well, first of all, you have to remember that, uh, you know, Porsche is, uh, is a Swabish company of sorts, and therefore they're extremely mindful of every, every Deutschmark uh, spent on, on the car. So, the, the, you know, they, they were very, very uh, controlling when it came to that aspect. And half the time, uh, projects did run over budget. I, I think that was most of the time. You know, even the 928, we went over budget. Part of the reason the 964 is what it is, it's because we went over budget, but not enough to get everything that we really wanted on the 964. No? <laughs> and that's the reason the 964 was more of a, a half step rather than the full step the 993 uh, eventually became. You know, it was a work of passion, not just from the engineering point of view, from a design point of view, but also for the Porsche family. It was a matter of pride because this was to be the most iconic Porsche at the time, given the, the technological package and promise that it had. And, and they simply had to deliver. So going over budget played a secondary role to getting the car right and you know, presenting a car that was just so exceptional. It, it was the right decision to make for the Porsche family and the board of directors, you know, to continue uh, with the car because the car, it delivered every promise that it, it had indicated. No? And this is what I mean, so much on that car is still relevant today. Another um, 911 based icon is the Speedster. And uh, of course you were project manager for that. I, I, I'm yeah. so keen to know what it was like to essentially revive an, a Porsche icon. Uh, that was quite a challenge, uh, especially in lieu of the fact that the, the information that I got to start it began with a little, a little sketch from Tony Lapine. And he, he scribbled some lines and he goes, this is what I'd like you to do. And that sketch was so, so rough and iffy from that meeting, which was held at the, uh, the viewing yard at Porsche where, where the gurus were meeting and they decided that I should lead the, 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 the team uh, sequestered in the wind tunnel to create the rebirth of the speedster using the Actually, back then, uh, the original thought was to use the 964 platform. No? Speedster was created with the 964 already in mind. But uh, right before introduction, the company decided to introduce the Speedster on the 911 SC body uh, rather than the 964 to create more buzz for the 964. Uh, I was disappointed, of course, because the, the Speedster was designed as a 964 from the get-go. Porsche was still a boutique uh, manufacturer at the time. Yeah. And it was through creating niche vehicles like the Speedster, were they able to expand the 911 line to create enough volume to make the company more profitable? Because the volume is, is where the profits come from. That's really interesting about the Speedster, like originally being planned for the, for the 964 and that kind of changing last minute. You know, everyone talks about the 965 as kind of a stillborn project. I'd like you to clear something up for me, Ben, if you don't mind, because a lot of people refer to a 964 Turbo as a 965. But to my mind, from the research that I've done, the 965 was, was an entirely different project. Yes, yeah, it was. Now, I was not involved with the 965, you know, another group had, had taken, taken that job on. Okay. But the idea behind the 965 was to take as much of the 959 and adapt it into the 964 platform to create an even greater uh, turbo yeah. uh, based off the 964 program. You know, it had much more complex four-wheel drive system, turbos. Uh, and the engine management systems and the electronic uh, hydraulic, electro hydraulic suspension systems that the Porsche was playing with at the time. You know, the 965 was to be the second generation 9, 959, literally. That was the vision for it. Huh? I guess the limited volumes uh, could not be justified to create a car above the, the 964 turbo. And that's probably what uh, 
you know, uh, killed it in the end. I'm pleased that you've been able to clarify that, Ben, to be honest, because I can't tell you the amount of times I hear people refer to their 964 Turbo as a 965, and it's not the case. So we'll come on to the, the 964, which, of course, you were a lead exterior designer for. Wow, where do we start? I mean, the 911 in its kind of G-bodied form, it had been around for years. It was very well established. Mm -hmm. and as a designer, how do you go around improving that and updating the 911 but still keeping it kind of quintessentially 911 to look at well first of all the you have to consider the the history of the company um there's just uh, so much iconology behind that 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 mark that in order to preserve uh, the dna or the identity of the car there's only so much you can do. When I got the opportunity to work on the 928, it was the 356 that actually inspired me to bring back that, that aerodynamic homogeneity that the 356 had. And the technology at the time allowed us to integrate certain things that allowed me to create something that was even more homogeneous for the car. And, and uh, fortunately, it became more accepted as more Porsche-like than you know some of the different styling trends that were prevalent at the time i mean the, the result as we know was the, the clean lines and, and the integrated bumpers from a kind of technological point of view were there any design challenges with the 964 perhaps again in reference to the active wing on the back of the car or, or any other aspects of the 964 again i'm looking at your early sketches i've seen the uh, the cooling ducts in the in the front and rear bumpers for example that obviously didn't make production well, the, the, um, the fact that the engines were getting larger, um, you know, Porsche was, was uh, going into transition um, into how to manage the fact that Porsches are still air-cooled without literally going to water cooling. So th there were limitations to what the engineers could derive uh, as far as increasing the horsepower and performance of the car without having to go to water cooling and that was a tremendous challenge but at the same time uh, certain components you know you could only get that thermal efficiency if you if you water cool certain components so you know uh, the, tr the engineering challenges translated into design challenges and then of course there's the, um, the safety regulations which mandated uh, five mile an hour crumple zones and so the design of the front was heavily influenced by the technology to allow the the crumpling of uh, certain body components without damaging the main body the main steel structure and therefore material choice for the bumpers were very critical um, you know the absorption of energy uh, uh, for safety was was very 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 important and heavily mandated by regulations in the u.s and in europe Mm. Uh, on top of the regulation for pollution and all that and then there was also the restrictions on lighting because back then headlamp uh, manufacturers as as the peak of technology you only had halogen lights at the time and everybody was trying to create um, faster more powerful cars and therefore you needed better lighting and the only way to do that with halogen lights was to have a large reflector. So unlike with today's, you know, LED technology, you can literally make a headlight about uh, an inch and have the same amount of light as the largest halogen powered uh, bulb you could at the time, you know. So there were a lot of these restrictions that, that uh, actually influenced the look of the car you know we take them for granted today but it was simply the limits of technology at the time that uh, allowed for this no? um peter schutz's uh, replacement heinz brunitsky I, I think i'm pronouncing that right when the 964 was kind of revealed he called it the 911 for the next 25 years kind of feeding again off the longevity of the g series did you guys at Porsche, particularly in the design department, did you believe that or had work on the 993 already started by that point? The 993 should have been the 964. Ranitsky uh, wrote the success of the introduction of the 959 and uh, you know, Porsche at the time tried to apply as much of what they've learned from the 959 onto the 964. 
you know, they've, they've captured a unique vehicle that was technologically um, very advanced, but also held together quite well. You know, it made sense introducing four wheel drive to a rear engine car that was very prone to pendulum swings in corners. No? It made the car safer, it made it perform better, and therefore Bernitsky uh, just capitalized on that platform. To, to, to say that you know this car is going to be the introduction of the the next era from then on the performance development of cars only got better and better and better no? yeah, yeah so the introduction of uh, new electronics the integration of uh, uh, some computer uh, uh, technology over the the old transistorized you know electronic systems from the 70s you know it, it changed everything yeah. Because suddenly everything was more compact. Yeah. And then you had uh, literally a computer uh, dictating how much of the suspension uh, could be modified or activated in order to make the car safer and actually handle better. No? Yeah. It made the ride experience uh, much more modern without compromising the the sporty attributes of a Porsche because that was still tantamount to anything Porsche had done. They did not want to compromise the driving experience of Porsche enthusiasts. No? So they wanted it to enhance it with the introduction of the electronics, the four wheel drive and the new suspension systems. No? Where you were saying that the 993 was kind of meant to be the spiritual successor to the, to the G-body cars. Was that due to costs as to why it was the 964 that actually was the successor to those or, or how did that come about? In the development of the 964, we uh, you can you, you can see that from the sketches that we already wanted to change the fenders and yeah. uh, uh, integrate uh, more changes to the to the basic architecture of the the 911. You know, move away from the the uh, the front fenders that that were very flat or, or very upright. Part of the reason for that was uh, aerodynamics you know getting the that edge of the headlights a little lower and technology for headlights was improving we could move away from a very planar lens and at the same time introduce a a much more you know a softer uh, side silhouette much more in keeping with what the 356 was compared to the 911. You know, when you look at the 356 and the 911, it is that shoulder form, that fender form, that, that separates the two. And that was all dictated by light technology at the time. And again, looking at your early designs, and your sketches, Fuchs wheels do feature in, in the arches of the car. At, at what point did it become apparent that Porsche wouldn't have Fuchs wheels on the 964? Uh, the improvements in suspension changed that. You know, because of the offsets, the offsets uh, that were necessary for the, I believe they called it negative camber or yeah. something in the new suspension systems that, um, that the 964 introduced. You know, they moved away from the front torsion bar suspension to, to adapting coilovers and, and uh, more traditional uh, suspension arms in the front. Yeah. So that affected the wheels and the Fuchs. If you can try and visualize how a Fox looks with, without any offset, it actually, it's no longer as appealing. You know? yeah, the yeah. appeal of the Fox was the fact that you had this you know, nice offset. You know? yeah. um, and, uh, you know, we did, we did experiment with multiple designs based on the Fox to try and maintain the, the character of the Fox, the mm -hmm. five-spoke Fox wheel. You know? But it, it was a, a huge challenge, and therefore we slowly moved away from the symmetry of the five-spoke Fuchs. No? That's super interesting. So it was, it was engineering that decided that rather than a stylistic sort of move. Yeah. By the same sort of token, was it always planned that midway through the 964's production life, it would change from the flag mirrors to the cup mirrors that are a bit more sleek in design? Or, or was that something that was kind of a bit ad hoc and just happened? <laughs> It was probably somewhat ad hoc. Yeah, it just happened, but um, but in, in in Porsche's way, you know, because uh, yeah. it's very rare that anything is accidental at 
at, at, at Porsche, the engineering constraint restricted the design. However, within that restriction, uh, as designers, we created the best that we could uh, yes. for those restrictions. No? Because yeah. it was always engineering driven first. No? They sell performance and everything is secondary to that. No? And so design has to play a role in that what, what, at whatever rank. You know? yeah. As long as the performance is not compromised. And that's why back then, you, maybe you could say that uh, German cars were not as sexy as the Italian cars. However, when it came to performance, my gosh, you know, okay. overtook all the styling that you could, you could possibly uh, want. You know? That's the magic of Porsche. You know? Yeah. Without a doubt. Obviously, you, you, you left Porsche, Ben, in, in 1989 and, and moved on to Mercedes-Benz. The 964, as well as the 959 and the Speedster and the 928 and the 944 Turbo, that was your incredible legacy at Porsche. With particular reference to the 964 and their rising, not just values today, but they, I think for many, they are the, the ultimate derivative of 911 today because it's that perfect mix of classic and modern how does that make you feel you know the reception of the 964 today oh uh, i am i'm so flattered by the reception that the 964 uh, is getting or has gotten you know? you know when the 964 was being developed you know internally we we almost referred to it as the ugly duckling internally we had a a a, a, a name for the car and uh, in german it's called schlauchboot you know? which means a rubber dinghy. You know? <laughs> right, okay, yeah. Because everything is, you know, uh, at the time, because of what we had done to the 964, everything was very rounded. You know, it, 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 not very many people were comfortable with how, you know, sometimes for some people thought it was overinflated in certain areas, you know, the front bumper, the rear bumper, and the rocker, rocker panels, you know. Uh, at times, you know, even I myself, you know, had, uh, had wished we had done more uh, in terms of changes, you know, and that's why it was very crucial to change the front fender and uh, make more changes to the rear fender in order to balance out the the volumes of the rear bumper to the front bumper. You know? At first, there were times where there were certain views where, you know, we thought ourselves that the car was a little bit, you know, heavy because of the the volumes of the front and the rear bumper but um, fortunately for me you know the the bosses uh, loved what we did and they accepted it and over time um, people or, or the buyers for 964 they they equally fell in love with it and then just uh, you know accepted it as a as, as a as a greater improvement on what was already very good to begin with with the 911 and you know like you said it, it was uh, it was it was a big challenge and we weren't sure that the public w w would actually like it as much as they have you know once uh, once we were done no? mm. but the the aerodynamics and the family look that we created finally just Pulled the car together. And, and by the same token, uh, Ben, I'd really like to know your thoughts on... There are, there are people, aren't there, that are reimagining the 964. Obviously, it started with seeing a vehicle design, but, I mean, there are plenty of companies here in the UK now that are reimagining the look of, of that 964. What's, what's your reaction to that? I think it's wonderful, you know. As uh, a matter of fact, uh, I would love to be involved in, in, in that again, you know, uh, because it, it's such a it's a great challenge and there's still so much you can do to it you know um one one aspect of the reimagining that I, I really like is the fact that with the 964 911 the size of the vehicle was for me near perfect you know the current 911s have gotten just a little bit too too large it's almost a different car perhaps it's just a generational thing from my perspective that the sports car it needs to be like a well-tailored suit, you know, versus a, a loose-fitting jacket, you know? um, and, and that, to me, is what the 911 was in the 964. Yeah. And I think a lot of them are experimenting with uh, how do you improve on that tight package, you know? Uh, some of them are playing with, with uh, extending the wheelbase, 
ever so slightly. And then the width, they're, they're looking at minuscule, you know, width uh, adjustments to improve the handling and, and the look. And, and some of them have actually done a very good job, you know. I think in that regard, to me, the reimagining uh, really works. You know, uh, Singer has done a tremendous job. Alois Roof in the past did some incredible things with with 9-11. But uh, I think today Singer is, uh, he epitomizes what you can do with, with the 9-11s and the 964s. From, from my point of view, it, it's great that you're so pro all of those kind of reimaginings today. And, and it goes without saying that the, the guys doing that today, they didn't have the same restrictions as, as you had to kind of work around with that 964 platform. Yeah, the unfortunate thing is there's, there's, there weren't many 964s to begin with. You want to maintain some of the, the traditional 964s and, and not just, uh, you know, completely modify them all out. It is an honor that uh, these people would actually try to continue where I left off and improve upon it. No? And I'm still associated with that. So for that very fact, I, I'm proud. When I began my design career, designers were not even allowed to have business cards because uh, car companies were so protective of their designers. They wanted to to maintain their designers and not allow their designers to be pilfered away by other companies. But over time, that unfortunately changed. We are a much more design-driven world than we were you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago. You, know? yeah. uh, you literally can't sell anything anymore without uh, industrial design being involved. And that's perhaps a good thing. It's a good yeah. thing for designers, but also for the customer. You know? yeah. uh, customer's appreciation for design is just growing and mm. uh, for me that's that's a compliment no? Ben what a fantastic way to, to end the interview here um, I do want to say thank you so much for all of your time today in, in, in sharing so many insights into that era at Porsche with the end of the G-bodied era and the start of the 964 we're, we're so grateful for you uh, imparting all that information onto us meant much of which I hadn't heard before I'm sure others wouldn't have either thank you so much Ben Dimson for your for your time you're welcome Lee it was a pleasure meeting you and it was a pleasure having this discussion yeah I hope uh, to see you or meet you actually face to face uh, sometime in the future and like we talked about earlier go for a drive together in the 911. <laughs>